Word. Let's do this old school, back in the day style, when I just started trolling OC Poetry. I wasn't a mod. Um, I was uh, slightly less published and esteemed as a poet myself. I went in, I locked limbs, and I just started trolling some fucking poetry and ripping things up. Um, good times. And uh, I don't want to lose my edge and I don't want you to lose yours. So let's uh, sort by new and um, look at some workshop poems. Only workshop because those are the people I feel are asking for it, right? Otherwise, it's not fair. Michael Jansen, what day is it? For I stand atop a hill. Look at that four. Mm, I don't know. I don't know, Mike. Why do you open with four? Four! It's a golf four for I stand atop a hill waltzing through space without time. Oh, it's one of these conceptual metaphysical, you know, like we're a, you know, astrophysicist who writes poetry in their free time. How has it been so long? How has what been so long? Are we, what hill are we atop of? Where are we? What are we doing? Why are we waltzing if we had to climb up the hill? Why are you mixing your metaphors? It, I think it was just a few months ago. Who sang that? So you, you see, see this, this, this guy's, these, these quotation marks. Again, I'm not saying you never put like quotation marks in a poem. I'm just saying it, it's tough to have dialogue in a poem, especially short poetry, um, you know, in, in a ballad type thing or longer narrative, sometimes sometimes we do see dialogue, but in a very short poem with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines, really don't have the room for dialogue here. In those months, years have passed, nostalgic for yesterday's dinner? You know, guys, I often say, like, I can only dig in and give you guys a whole bunch of st feedback on poems that kind of um, have enough material for me to work on. And this is just case in point. Um, so in terms of, like, where would I pull the plug as an editor and be like, I, I can't work with this poem? It would be almost immediately four I stand atop. This four here is really um, kind of drawing attention to itself. Um, why not say after climbing the hill? What and then what? What do you go? Where do you go from there after climbing the hill? Then what? 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 What do you do with this poem? I, I don't know. I don't even know where to go. I think waltzing through space without time is is kind of where I'd pull the plug. Um, in terms of things Michael Johnson needs to do, Michael Johnson should um, read some poetry of, um, you know, um, how people like um, James Wright, for example, um, who um, uh, kind of modeled this kind of um, lyric, bucolic, uh, contemporary style. You could read a lot of James Wright and get a lot better, a lot quicker. Okay, loose change. Oh, looky what I found. Red the Timid. Huh? All right. Let's see what Red's up to here. Loose change. A quarter century slips like a coin into a gutter. So it's a good opening. It's a bold gambit. So we're opening with a with a strong metaphor. You see how much how how the halfway through the line we get this like and um, that's a, a kind of a, a very big um, conceit. Um, meaning uh, it proposes this kind of central image for the poem. Um, you know how Shakespeare does. Um, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Um, this is a little bit, you know, a similar style of opening with this like um, comparing uh, the quarter century um, slipping to a coin into a gutter. It's also a well, it's well imagined. Um, so we can kind of feel that sense of like, oh, you know, the, the coin is, is gone. We can feel it slipping out probably because of these sounds, this um, 
Um, this hard quarter sound is then immediately followed by the, the, the soft C, uh, hard C, soft C, quarter century. Then we got, an, uh, we got another S, slips. And then we go back to the hard C, coin. And then the coin, uh, the, the hard C uh, becomes guttural and the G, G sound into gutter. Um, so the, this variance in initials, in the, in the initial consonant of these words, gives us this um, very um, um, intuitive um, kind of lizard brain impression of, of what's going on here. And it continues, I slouch by the sidewalk, but I slouch by the sidewalk and watch rivulets of leaf rot and cigarette butts slide along the asphalt toward the drains. So this sentence here, um, you know, we know it's going to go down the drain, right? So um, it's a, perhaps a little bit extra um, extended, um, a little bit, uh, one too many um, syllables expended to get here, but still very, very good, right? And we see this is, this is four lines before we get to the hard stop here. That's telling us something we're kind of working in this kind of quatrain measure. Some days slip away. This sum is really good, well-timed. A sum, so it's a rhetorical sum. Could say days slip away or all days, but this sum gives the reader a little bit of opening here, um, and and allows the the poem to then perhaps push against that. It gives us a little bit of t surface tension um, on the on the rhetorical side, which is kind of the, the argument that a poem makes. Some days slip away with the grace of a hand. This grace is also well-timed, how it goes back to the gutter. See how the first line opened with gutter, and this line now goes with, goes with grace of a hand. Striking skin. The sting so transient I cannot help but graze, back to the G sound, the spot. The touch my fingertips, touch my fingertips to see what was taken. Again, we get the full stop after four lines, another quatrain. So we know we're set up for the sonnet because we have these two quatrains form the octave, and then we have the full stop. So we're going to pivot to the last six lines, and we know we are dealing with a sonnet. Let's see if Red can prosecute the sonnet form accurately. We go back to sum. Not 100% sold there. Some nights, because we already had that here, so we need to amplify um, beyond some. We need to we need to we need to go a different direction. Some uh, I I would think all nights would be too emphatic though. You know, lost nights. I don't know. Cling to me like a bonfire, like bonfire smoke. Oh, beautiful image. Beautiful image, throwing everything I ever burned back against my body until I become a sponge to be wrung by it, by any hand fit to wrap around me. I search my body for what it's stolen and find pockets full of wishes spit out of wells. So I think the challenge here, although this is a beautiful, beautiful poem overall and a beautiful ending, the challenge I have is this, this there's not really um, any real change in perspective or not enough change in perspective to justify this volta. And the volta is the transition between the first eight and the last six. Instead, we continue to introduce new imagery. So here we have the cigarette butts, we have the coin, and we don't return to reflect on any of those things, particularly the coin, which is the opening conceit in this idea of, of money, or, or really, uh, to me, it echoes, again, we've talked about this on the channel before, the parable of the talents, and Milton has a sonnet on that, um, so that's going to be important when you have this this money. Money in poetry world isn't cash, right? It's opportunity. It's talent. It's promise. Um, it's it's kind of um, what could happen in the future. That's oftentimes what what money represents, and it represents death. You know, it's it's the it's the coin um, that gets you into the underworld. Um, so here, this this um, this 
very interesting, provocative, um, well-executed conceit that opens the sonnet, we don't really return to it. We find this stolen, which echoes it, because stolen is, is around these, these monetary matters and these pockets full of. Um, and, the, and I guess the wells also. But it, it's the, it, instead, to me, the central image of this, of this sestet um, is this bonfire image, which uh, we have the cigarettes burning here, but um, it's distracting to me to have such a bold and fascinating new image introduced in the last six lines. And that would be something I would perhaps be cautious about or introduce it earlier. Um, if we introduce this idea of the bonfire up in these first eight and perhaps got rid of the cigarette butts, um, then we could return to imagine the effect of this, of this bonfire smells and what that means. And then we could have a sestet that is focused exclusively on reflection and contemplation without it re-narrating and kind of expanding the scope. The eight lines are there to establish the scope and then the six are to inspect, reflect, and ultimately contract to give us this kind of um, quickening feeling is, is the specialty of the sonnet. Uh, however, this is all advanced topics here for um, read the timid's ears only who's ready for it ready to handle the advanced course but it's all fundamentals folks it's all fundamentals any turn in any poem um, needs to be a pivot of perspective okay let's move on life is good by tucci mane tutti frutti life is good Walking the plank to Marina Blues, interrupted by subtle sailboat pleas to take a breather, to hear sun basking seagull preachers, to see life in these rubber ducks bobbing to superior's wake, scheming for bread, these leaky steam pipes clamor in Midwestern keys, soaking papyrophobia, papyrophobia, okay, that's fear of paper, I suppose. Uh, Sturgeon, no doubt, laugh at my expense. So normally I jump on people for these long lines um, that, that you know, are kind of pushing towards um, prose cadence. But um, I think this is kind of Whitman-esque. Um, not, not hugely bothered. Um, but it could be something to consider. Could we discipline these lines into something, into a kind of a, something closer to iambic pentameter in, in length? Um, and without having to go, let's look at how many syllables we have. Walking the plank to marina blues interrupted by subtle. We have like, you know, 14, 15 uh, stresses or, or feet. You know, that that's a lot. I would say if you could get this down to, to 10 stresses in a line. Um, you know, maybe you do seven stresses in one line and you do 10 in another, or, you know, maybe you give yourself an extra stress, you do 11. And, but this, this line is, is I think a little bit too much. Um, and then this line is awful. I like ragged lines. Uh, Tom Lux, uh, the dearly departed Tom Lux did these really successful, uh, kind of built his career with, with bold imagery and, and kind of these ragged variants in, in in lines um so that would be something to check out um because this is this is sort of tom locks esque i think although i think he he probably has a little bit more economy um in terms of if i were an editor of have i pulled the plug i haven't pulled the plug yet so i'm, I'm wondering you know what the 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 this this is kind of a, a to me like a sketch like a notepad you know sort of like an how an artist does a kind of a gesture of a landscape or a person or still life or whatever. This is a little bit like that. I can I can kind of feel the 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 poet sketching here. So they have us situated. We're in a specific place in time. Um, we kind of get this, this. The mood is very is very well established. Let's see where we go from that. Take 
in Giant's advice and his children's despair. So I don't know, is this like a, uh, a parent with their toddlers? Take in Sal and Co. So this is this I think to me is is uh, is a miss because this is this is an internal notation. This is kind of a private note that only the poet and their friends and relations could understand. Take in the road in which you paved and painted that swan dives into bay life's nectar. So it's hard for me to see how literally the you in this poem paved a road. Uh, they're probably not a builder. The paving that they do is a metaphorical paving. The painting that they did is, is um, painting with their imagination. The swan dives, so, okay, into bay life's nectar. Okay, take in rotted grain for remediation. So I'm now kind of missing, I'm, I'm, I'm sliding off. So as, as your editor here, as your potential publisher, I'm, I'm pretty much 90% lost. So you had a lot of potential to work with here in this, in, these, in this first stanza, but now you gotta deliver to me some type of crisis or difficulty that your poem is going to resolve. Hopefully that would happen early on in the poem or you would find a way to amplify and exit you know hit it and quit instead i think we're kind of lost we're like we we kind of wade in um to to this low tide or whatever and and get stuck in this kind of mud here um i'm really not sure where the poem is going to go after taking giant's advice which i can't see sal and co i can't see that or understand that Taking the road you paved is just a stretch and is distract, distracting. Rotted grain for remediation then is, a, is, is um, I think this is it. Um, so where, where would we cue that we're gonna be talking about um, the production of cereals, that we're gonna be talking about harvest, that we're gonna be talking about these types of concepts. Where does the poem set us up for that? It has this much more nautical vibe. Now I understand Lake Superior is, is not salt water, uh, but still we're talking about all these all these themes of, of kind of um, um, you know vacationy type of um, vibes, um, not harvest vibes. Um, and th this is just too much of a change up. Uh, I don't understand where the poem is, is going to go. It's, it's very, was very interested in birds before. Um, and I don't know, uh, I guess the birds could be attracted to the rotted grain, but why for remediation? Ah, if this is a continued portrait of Beachside, I think it's interesting. It's just not successful yet. I don't know why we're taking it in. I don't know why we're walking. I don't know who, who is doing that. Not that that necessarily matters if it's just a tour, if it's just like, you know, this is a virtual tour for us of, of something, a landscape that is significant to the poet or the speaker, that, that could be enough. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. And frankly, bored. Okay. Okay, uh, neighborhood only, sky undressed. Okay, uh, so that's a good title, sky undressed. So, so what you know, the, the title's pretty successful there. What is it undressed of? Is it un undressed of, of stars or clouds? Um, let's find out. My wingspan has grown wild from all those years spent crushed under strangers' coats. Okay. Let's take you under my wing. Definitely has new meaning in this poem. Searching and captive in cool clubs. I don't know why your wingspan would grow wild under there. I, I think that would that would hamper the development of your wingspan brimming with mean friends and ugly men okay you're a hip bird 
under those ceilings I can see myself now airborne and lost a balloon let go from a stroller I would consider opening with something like this you know under nightclub ceilings I can see myself now uh, M dash airborne and lost a balloon let go from the stroller and then my wingspan has grown has you know I don't know how it's grown wild that, that part has my wingspan has not matured from all these years spent crushed under strangers coats that would be better would make more sense just floating in the uber home engulfed in cherry air freshener okay why do we need to know you're engulfed in cherry air freshener why why does this advance the aims of the poem what is the aim of the poem how have we gotten this far this is supposed to be a bildungsroman so that the kind of development of the creative person the development of the poet the 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 kind of creation of, of of them as 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 a hero um i'm not sure why we need to see them engulfed in cherry air freshener asking please 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 can i have the aux so i assume this is a music reference they want to plug in their their own music um and you know hear their own song Again, I'm not sure why we as a, as a reader are going to be concerned with any of this. Um, so are they, are you like a DJ or something? Why do you need the ox? Um, why is that relevant to the aims of this poem? Why is this an essential detail for us as the reader? Not as the writer. That's where you guys always get confused. Why does the reader need to know about the cherry air freshener? and the ox of all the things you can choose to put in you've put this in all right now we're going to change scenes which is where let me tell you as an editor um you know there <laughs> that's where you're going to lose people right this morning the sunlight hit my face so sincerely i almost laughed okay so the sincerity of the sunset is is stated in um, very baldly. Um, so it's it's instead of letting the reader conclude the quality of the light is sincere and make that association, you're providing it to them. But you're providing it after this full stop and change of scene after the ox. Uh, is the reader going to think you're, a, you know, a spoiled club kid or just, um, you know, someone who? Um, you know, needs to get their shit together in life and figure out what their priorities are. Um, we don't know. I, I think that the plug for me is, is completely pulled. You cannot have my ox would be my, if I'm driving the, the, the Uber as the reader, this is the point where I say, nope, no, you can't. I like my music. Um, so you're you're asking too much of the reader would, would be would be um, my concern here. Okay, Ars Poetica, Sella. All right, Ars Poetica. Uh, so the first Ars Poetica named Ars Poetica is uh, from our buddy Horace, who wrote a poem instructing and discussing. Um, the Art of Poetry and its features um, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, it also advanced Horace's reputation successfully. Um, there have been many Ars Poeticas written. Um, a uh, friend of my wife, when she was at grad school at, at, uh, at Brown, uh, he had this... Um, habit of trying to figure out how many titles at the library were, were called arse poetica see where you go with this Sella. i'm glad i'm dead if i wasn't i'd have to lock the door but at my funeral you can laugh then walk right in the house i made since it's not mine
Huh. Okay. So the poet's saying, I think, I mean, the, the poem, the, the speaker of the poem is saying, you know, um, basically that you're going to encounter my poem or, or my work as, as if, as if I'm dead. So let's just go ahead and fast forward to, to, to my death. Um, well, if I wasn't dead, if I wasn't able to, to release my poems to you in this way, imagining my death, I'd have to lock the door. I mean, I, I would be fearful of intrusion. I would be possessive of my own stuff. So then why the funeral? My, but at my funeral, you can laugh. Why would we laugh at, at, the, at the, the death of, of this, 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 this metaphorical death of the author? I think that this couplet to me is is a little bit a little bit of a miss. A little bit of a miss. Then walk right in the house I made since it's not mine. So it's it's become collectively literature. That's a bold gambit. I mean it, it you know it has it become collectively literature yet, you know. Here's a slim window traced with stain stand before the view I framed. Okay, well we are Maybe open with this, you know, this, this to me, uh, would, would be a better opening than I'm glad I'm dead. Um, I think this, this would be where you want to situate the reader's eye. You're saying I can specify where you look in this house. Okay. Run your, and then we continue, run your handle on the floor. If something catches, I left it there. So in other words, it's on purpose. Anything we find in this poem is by design, right? Divide the walls and clear a space for the falling light, the rising wind. Walk on alone. You need no tour. So that, I definitely agree with that, Sela, um, as an Ars Poetica. I, I've described poems like gardens, right? So we can design and, um, you know, cultivate very specific elements of the garden, but we can't control how the reader experiences the garden. And although there might be a clear path that they're supposed to take to progress, uh, readers might, might choose their own path. They might wander around and revisit certain areas and return to certain parts of your poem over and over again and neglect another part. Um, and that organic relationship that they have with it, that, that it changes in different seasons, their experience of it, I think it, to me is true to the craft. Now, other people... Um, have described poems perhaps as like a playground or, you know, gymnasium or something where you can give the reader all these different things to amuse themselves with, but it's really up to them to make meaning and order and, and do what they want. I think the garden, to me, the, the garden is such an old metaphor, um, you know, Adam and Eve level of old, um, or you know Plato level of old that it, that it seems to put the put the right things in play for my imagination. Now Sella here is, is saying house. I think what's interesting about the house metaphor, the first thing that I would come to mind about a house is a, as opposed to a garden. It's this indoor space. It's a living space, and it, it is in some ways a house is is maternal. I mean, there's really not a lot of reasons for having a house unless. You either plan to keep, you know, livestock at the first level and sleep in the second, or you know, you plan to procreate. You, you plan to populate this house. Um, so there's this idea then of creativity to me, latent in this poem, as, as being about generation, um, generating things and and creating the next generation. Um, I think there's 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 definitely some work to be done. I, I think the simplicity of this poem is part of its strength, but um, there's there's not quite enough going on. Walk on alone. You need no tour. This was my life, but you live here. So I think that's the the challenge here is 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 most people don't live in poems. We visit them, but we don't. Um, abide in them permanently we come we like as readers to come and go as we please um and we don't like to be dictated no 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 i'm gonna lock you in here or no you go you, you can live here if you want there's very few poems i felt like i've i've really lived in um you know count a handful of them where i felt like um 
you know, more than a day or two at a, at a time, their lines stayed with me uh, or have framed um, how I approach my writing in such a fundamental way that I find them almost imprisoning. Um, George Herbert, uh, some of his poems have, have done that for me. I feel like I've, I've, I've uh, lived in his poem, Prayer, whether I like it or not. Um, so that's a big, ambitious ask. Um, so I, 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 I love the ambition. And I love this central conceit, a central heroic metaphor of this poem. Uh, I would not open with I'm glad I'm dead. They're going to figure that out. You know, um, I would I would consider opening um, opening the poem here. And I would give us um, some more salient details about this house. In particular, the reader, if I'm going into someone else's house to wander around, you fucking better be damn sure I'm either going to be going to the basement or the bedroom. That's just how people are. We're curious people. We're not going to spend that much time in the living room because while you're alive, we probably could have come there anyway. So appeal to our prurience a little bit and show us some stuff. You touch on that with trace with stains, but we don't know anything about these stains. We want to know about um, at least show us some of, uh, uh, bring us nearer to some of the central passion that animated your life. You might be too young to know that yet, though. Okay. Marriage story. All right. Marriage story. So I can already see these lines look like prose to me. And it is my assumption that a prose poem would, would not have that many paragraphs. Um, so already I'm confronted but as an editor, as your potential publisher here. You BSP or for from boom. As a, your potential publisher, I'm already concerned with how you've decided to frame and shape your poem. I'm not sure it's going to be successful because it looks like a mess. I greet you, the one who comes to my door. What shall I call you, tender comrade? So this diction here, um, this kind of um, 19th century diction is almost certainly going to not work. So as your editor, I'm almost already done. I'm the one for it is I who bend the tall grasses claimed the sweet one. Welcome spirit of the wind. Come take seat on my diaphragm and make home in my lungs assented the true hearted. I can't follow this. It seems like uh, some, you know, 19th century stuff and new age stuff and, you know, stuff just put in a blender and I can't, I can't figure it out. I, I think this, this, this syntax here of, of, you know, um, shall here, this we should be pretty careful about and tender comrade. I mean, unless this isn't a joke, uh, I think this is something we should be pretty cautious about. Um, and the one who comes to my door, I mean, why not just open, I greet um, a stranger coming to my door whose name I don't know. What? Sh how shall I call you, stranger? Uh, and then I think guess this is the answer from the stranger i'm the one for it is i who bend the tall grasses claim claim the suit one so again this dialogue thing is really 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 difficult to pull off in poetry if you want to do that you should probably write flash fiction or something like that I'm not trying to be the genre police here. I'm just telling you, if you want to get better as a poet and you're trying to write short lyric stuff, focusing on dialogue 
may delay your development, right? So instead of structuring this as dialogue, you know, I greet a stranger who comes to my door and, uh, and not knowing what to call them, I ask. And, their an and they answer, I am the one who bends the grasses. Why do we need the tall grasses? And why are they sweet? Okay. I'm the one who bends the grasses. And then um, I welcome in the spirit of the wind and ask they take a seat uh, and ask them, invite them into my diaphragm, into my lungs. Something. We'll go from there and see, see what happens. See what happens. Okay, I would get out of this narrative structure that you have, this storytelling structure, because poetry, short poetry, typically, typically isn't set up to succeed there. Let's see if you got some comments. You didn't. I'm sorry for that. Hopefully this, this point points you in some type of direction to work with. All right. Let's do one or two more. I'll call it. The white lilies. When my niece was born, okay, who is this? Silly equipment. Okay, silly equipment. When my niece was born, I grimaced. So this opening um, really, um, I think, has this effect of, of turning the reader away, um, kind of walling them away, because this, this grimace is such a negative emotion um, you know, um, it doesn't have the effect of inviting the reader to join you. Um, and it, it's going to cue them that, 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 that your attitude towards, um, towards this baby is, is perhaps um, not going to be terribly, terribly positive. I think this is going to be borne out. When my niece was born, I grimaced. Her mother kissed her cheek like a thief. Why would you grimace at that? When she laid her on the wooden cradle, it looked like a guillotine. So this is so overwhelmingly, crushingly dark and and grim. Um, you know, I I do think you're you're gonna lose your reader really quickly, and then you're gonna restart. You're gonna reboot. When my niece was born, every heart became less heart and more the size of it. It doesn't make that much sense. A clenched fist beating around the bush. You got to tell us, man. Or woman or person. You got to tell us. Put it out there. You know, my niece was 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 uh, born to a bad mom. Or I'm, I'm sorry about your mother. You know, otherwise, I think setting out this stuff of, of, of the guillotine and, you know, the clenched fist beating around the bush um, is is perhaps seen. It could be seen as punishing this this child that, you know, um, I don't know. I think we have some I mean, we, we can write poems that are that are um, of kind of concentrated darkness that, that don't necessarily offer the, the reader hope or, or you know, um, sustenance or uh, it's not the responsibility necessarily of, of the poet to kind of broaden the horizons or delight or um, expand the, 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 the heart of the reader. But it sure shit is nice when that happens. Um, sad poems um, should um, also open us to the possibility of, of non-sad things potentially occurring um, so that you kind of have this, um, you know, uh, uh, branching effect of, of different possibilities um, implicit in, in, in negative things. Um, but I'm not really sure um, where we're going to go. Uh, I think if this is a situation where you where you don't trust um, the mother of the baby, you need to put that in immediately, and and you you feel like the the mother is not going to be able to be responsible for their own child. I think you you'd want to 
open with that as explicitly as possible. Um, and, and, and this just is going to be a challenging poem to, to, to write. Um, I feel like a lot of people come to Reddit kind of loaded up with a lot of difficult feelings and emotions sometimes, or they're, they're angry or they're in a bad place. And they turn to poetry and they turn to Reddit in order to express themselves and, and find other people who are experiencing similar things. Uh, and they're hoping that poetry could be that, that bridge. And, and, and I admire that. I just don't know whether that's going to work in a workshop context. In a workshop context, our, our goal is to write better poetry. Um, so connecting us with other people is important, but connecting us in terms of um, finding poems that are subject to improvement and that are improvable. Sometimes it's good. Like Sella took this high stakes poem about um, ridiculously her legacy as a poet when she's dead and how people could encounter and explore her legacy and, and all these, these ideas um, that are fun, um, but really ambitious um, and high stakes in that sense, because she's inviting people to, to, to judge the poem against this kind of lo preposterously lofty standard of horses, monuments more lasting than bronze. Um, so it's a very ambitious poem, and it's kind of fun to kind of, you know, um, you know, look at very ambitious poems. This, too, because of the subject matter, it is necessarily ambitious because handling topics like this requires great sensitivity as a poet. That sensitivity takes a long time to develop. So sometimes it might be easier to tackle topics that are less loaded for you personally in the workshop. Because if they're less loaded for you personally, then you're going to be able to, to attack them a little bit e more easily. And it will be easier to take criticism and respond and work with that. Um, because... If I wrote a poem about some of the most important things in my life and I put them in there, you know, about my children or my wife or my parents or whatever, initially, I think I'm at a place now where people criticize it and we're just like, lol, like whatever with that line. I'd probably be fine with it, um, you know, but still my initial response would probably be something like, you know, you guys should get fucked. You know, what do you know about my family? But it's not the reader's job to know about my family, right? I'm supposed to be writing something that balances this feeling of intimacy and conveys that without really actually being personal to me. It might give the reader a feeling that it's profoundly personal to me. But by definition, it's not. It's shared. It's public. It's communal. It's a sacrifice of myself that everybody gets to partake in in the entire village. If you write poems that are very, very, very personal and guarded and turn people away, they're not going to be able to partake of that communion of your poem when your poem dies, which is when you release it, when you let go of it, as Sela tried to do from her first line. All right, let's look at the fox skull. Rococo, Rococo art, fox skull. At the back of my garden, a fox's skull sits, squid ring sockets, an elongated snout that was still searching in the dark, brushing leaves aside, feeling wetness, and through the cobwebs, I picked it up. So we're doing some really good stuff here, Rococo. We've really situated the reader very, very well on the back of the garden. And you know that garden is the million-dollar word right there since we was just talking about gardens. Uh, and we get to the habeas corpus. We produce the corpse of the, of the fox, the skull, almost immediately, which is very effective. It, it, quite immediately, almost more than immediately, the very first line. Bold open, great, superb, squid ring sockets. I'm not sure. I think I can see that. An elongated snout. This elongated here 
I'm wondering what this is furthering, what we're advancing specifically by focusing on the elongatedness. I guess that leads into the still searching in the dark. So that's a kind of almost as if the fox was stretching to find something. Brushing leaves aside feeling wetness. This wetness, I think, is a, is a weak word. Well, I would like for you to be able to convey um, the cold or chill or dampness um, or, um, you know, kind of uh, the autumn of the fox's existence um, without needing to resort to an adjective to do, the, do this work. So we end up with a lot of adjectives or adjectival work in this first stanza. And through cobwebs, again, it's, um, I wouldn't really say cliche, but shopworn, we kind of feel like, how could we cover this sensation you know, um, of, of reaching through the cobwebs without having to um, literally say it um, to the reader. And we're going to continue in this kind of adjectival frame, which I think is, is going to be the challenge for this poem, the bones curvature. So this is just observing something, but um, uh, could we get rid of that? Uh, um, could we skip this, the sensation of a lover's lips? Um, but what is the sensation of the lover's lips? So this, again, ne needing to resort to this seems to me that we've only done half the work. So you're looking at the fox skull and thinking about the lover's lips because of the curvaceousness, I suppose, of, of, the, of the bone structure of the fox. But we would like to convey that in a way that's more tidy uh, we have these multi, these polysyllabic uh, Latinate words doing a lot of the heavy lifting to convey these sensations. I'm not, not really sure. So now we're going to get somewhere. I dug this skull up with my father. I think we could get to this line earlier. I would like to see this as early as possible. Um, and we could return to some of this adjectival stuff later if we have more time. You know, it, it's going to help the cadence and aggressiveness of this poem, that this poem is going to put us on a more proactive stance if we get to the father soon. The back of my ga garden, a fox, uh, we unearth the fox's skull, squid ring sockets, elongated snout. My father and I unearthed her when he was healthy. See, and we're getting somewhere quickly. We're going to talk about this relationship. The fox is a proxy for something about this relationship. And I saw it plucking worms from the earth. We need to know that. Maybe. I place on a shelf in the shed. Do I need to know that? Among the lily lamps, rat killer and darkness. Do we need to know that? I understood my own skull will release teeth one day. Do we need to know any of this? Now that we have the father, where the reader is going to be curious about that relationship, they're going to want to know and see what where that goes. Do we get back to the father? No. So I think you, you, you have another option. You could excise the father out of this poem if you wanted to. I think that would be a cowardly act, but you could do that. You could take the father out of this poem and then you, you, you could safely contemplate um, like uh, Hamlet um, at, um, uh, contemplates his um, uh, uh, what's his name? The, the jester um, who uh, entertained him when he was a child. Um, you could do that, um, but um, that's been done, I suppose. Um, and uh, the, the fox is, is not a, je a je uh, you know, a clown. Um, so um, you're going to back yourself in a little bit of a corner. The exciting, interesting thing to the reader was, uh, the back when he was healthy part, you know, the, 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 the father's going to die too. So the, the discussion of the, of the fox and, and the death of the fox, it's almost like um, you guys are kind of uh, 
uh, predestining or, or divining and seeing ahead and in, into the, the father's mortality. It's very interesting. And, and I, I think this poem is going to be successful to me, very successful, um, should it pivot to that and, and really um, focus on that as its, as its central idea. All right. Um, I think um, we're, we're about uh, running out of steam here, but maybe, maybe we'll just have a quick look at Counterfeit Girl. Should we? Should we, people? I don't know. Rumstrict, Counterfeit Girl. Seven-year-old me, innocent and naive, crushing on boys at school but not in the same way other girls did. I was just trying to feel cool. When I was nine, I felt so confined by what a girl was supposed to be. Hair bows, dresses, mermaids, ballet. None of those felt like me. So I think this poem is going to end up ultimately delivering an important message and it's um, going to have something significant to say um, to its uh, to all of us and particularly its population. And I think that's fantastic. I don't have any problem with that. I think if, if we're looking at the kind of the prosody here, the complexity of the verse um, and the, the kind of... Um, um, overall ambition of, of the type of, of thoughts that and, and complexity that the, the poem wants to take on and the way it wants to reflect on this in a kind of um, um, a poem that is, is kind of um, uh, Dr. Seussian. Uh, so it's, it's not only written from a child's perspective, it, it seems written primarily for a children's book as an audience. Um, and uh, that's that's not 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 my specialty, right? So so children's lit um, isn't my thing, and uh, I could say it could be done better and worse. And this looks like it was is it's done pretty well, um, but it, it's not what we do on this channel. All right, wildfire. So this has the fire emoji which disqualifies me from discussing it because it means you're dumb. The blind see not even black. The abyss. Okay, we got to do this, guys. We got to do this. God, we got to do this. Persimmon, cinnamon. Dramatic reading for me, okay? <clears throat> and then we'll call it quits. The blind see not even black. Okay, this is written by Batman, okay? The abyss does call welcoming us a constant fall free from mortal coil nothing fractured hope posing as bliss incomprehensible through eyes that still see darkness and oblivion alike even darkness is entirely Something, but the blind see not even black things, so arise to ford another day. Each and every one feel you may. All right. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Persimmon, for being a good sport. I love you. Uh, my friend, and uh, thanks for bringing some joy into our lives. And thank you to all the poets putting yourself out there, taking the risk. If you want in-depth feedback from me and you want to get nitty gritty, you got to subscribe. And then you can DM me some stuff if you subscribe. No subscribe, no helpy. Okay, go on, subscribe, send me a DM. We can talk about anything you want. Just make sure you join me on my journey because we're going to be doing some hot shit. Shit, 
very soon. Every day. Thank you.